that's if nobody died. <laughs> and we used to sit around the radio on Saturday night to listen to Hockey Night in Canada, which is what I did with my grandpa. That was because we didn't have any television yet. So I'm a big fan of the radio, and I'd like to, uh, in, in a way, it is our future. Because watching everything really slows down the brain process. Listening to it, that's his dream. So I'm an undiagnosed dyslexic. I had a really hard time in school. In fact, my mother told me before she died that I was the little kid that walked to school crying most days. So I ran away. And <laughs> it took me a long time to get here, but I came when I was 25. And uh, I stopped in Bali. And there I met my wife, Cynthia. And together, we built a very big, very incredible jewelry business. We then sold the jewelry business. And it was all like a dream, endless, endless golf. And uh, I was wondering what to do. So she took me to see a, a film that I instinctively didn't want to see. And the film is called Inconvenient Truth. And this guy ruined my life, <laughs> ruined my retirement, and continues to ruin my life. So here we are. Bali, it's a tiny little island, 60 miles by 90 miles. You could lose it many places in the world and never find it. And it's an intact, relatively speaking, Hindu culture. And that's the amazing attraction. So Cynthia and I decided to do something unusual, to do something local. The Green School is down the road from where our jewelry factory was. And this is it. And it doesn't look like a school. I'm sure that my school looked very much like your school, that looks like the schools you send your kids to today. And they were mostly manufactured by architects using the same materials they used to build the insane asylum, the hospital and the jail. <laughs> so we took a step. We took a step out of the box. The classrooms have no walls. The blackboards are made from bamboo. And it's amazing to feel the breeze. Green school kids are smiling. And for me, that was a, an amazing thing to experience. And we practice a kind of education which is called holistic. And it's, it's basically considering the whole child, considering the, all the aspects of the child. And it's really important to think about to think about holism. We also practice learning by doing. You learn your geometry in the classroom, you practice it in the blacksmith shop. So we send our kids for 181 days a year to a box to be alone with a single teacher. They're basically reviewed two 20 minute periods during the year. And we end up creating guys like this. <laughs> if you see yourself there, think about how you'd be if you had had a holistic education. Think about how you'd be if you demanded a whole world to live on. The classrooms have desks in them that are not rectangular. The teachers arrange them, the students arrange the desks constantly in different patterns. 
the breeze travels through the classrooms and there are fans. And when it gets too hot, we deploy bubbles. And it's not the kind of bubbles you're thinking about. It's not the PVC bubble. It's something you guys really know a lot about. It's called rubber and canvas. When I went to the rubber forest, I discovered rubber. And so we make bubbles that are inflated. Our natural materials, it lasts about two years, and we have to re redo it. But when it goes to the compost heap, it deposes very nicely. So what we did was we turned the box where we all work, live, and go to school into a bubble. And it has a great effect on these children sitting in an oval. They feel very, the grade four kids feel very grown up to be sitting in an oval having a discussion. These kids did a little graffiti on their desks. And uh, then they signed up for two extra courses that really weren't optional. The first one was called sanding. The second one was called rewaxing. These are green bamboo desks. And what the kids got was that they own their environment now. It's not some alien environment that belongs to someone else. It's their desks. And when they do mark them up, they know they can sand them down and rewax them. This is an amazing little thing. It's a vortex. It's in um, Austria. It produces enough power for 47 average size. The teachers put PVC, I don't see one here, but you all work on them, whiteboards in the classrooms. And I hadn't expected this. I was thinking about blackboards. And we found an amazing solution. These are old automobile windshields with white paper on the back on an easel, and they're the first real solution, sustainable solution to, to whiteboards. The school sits in a 20-acre garden. Between Ubud is here, Sanur is here, the beach is there. It's about a 20 or 30 minute commute from all those communities. It's a very beautiful, unspoiled part of Bali. And through it runs an amazing river. And this is the grade school symbol. And it, you know when you, when you have a lot of things and you're sleeping and the telephone rings, like children, old parents, houses, well, the telephone rang. And guess what? Mr. Gore knocked our bridge out with a giant flood. And it's gone. And I woke up the next three or four days. I was in Europe. And the first thing that came into my mind was, oh my god. It wasn't as bad as when my mother passed. But it's really, it's really traumatic. And a 40-year-old tree was washed out of the side of the river by those rains that we've been hearing about this morning, hit the bridge like a battering ram, and literally knocked it off its footings and dragged it down the river. One step forward, two steps backward, but we're going to build, the man is coming from South America, and we're going to build a new bridge. It's not just a school. When you do, when you're smart in America, you put Neiman Marcus in the middle of your shopping center because that's the anchor. And I spent a lot of time with Neiman Marcus in my days as a jeweler. The school is the anchor to a community. I met a man who came to the school and I said, welcome to Green School. And he looked at me, he was a little bit crazy. And he said, I've been on an airplane for 24 hours. He had a dream about a Green School when he was a kid. I mean, how many of you, you're all pretty young, but how many of you were happy in school? Just stick up your hand. <laughs> how many of you were physically beaten? <laughs> so he saw the green school, got on an airplane, and he's there now. 
He's taken his agro-architectural talents to be a bamboo builder. He's building a giant, a giant chocolate factory, and he's there. Chocolate factory is third green business in the environs of the school. It's really time to rethink. I was with a big developer in Singapore and a publicly listed company in a giant high rise, and he somehow heard about what we're up to. And he has an island over here and he wants us to do a spa. And I said to him, well, do you have any tents? And he looked at me like, I can give you a, one of those uh, couple computer generated things. I said to him, no, I don't understand. We have to take the design team there and stay a few days, see where the moon comes up, see where the breeze comes from, see where the sun comes from. And then we sketch, we dream, we sketch. And it's so important to build a building for where you are. And then you build a model, and you build another model until you think you've really got it right, and you build little stick people, and you put them in the model to run around, and you think about it. And when the engineers are finished, you have a model, an engineered model. It's called Green Village. My daughter, who was busily designing prints and patterns for LVMH in New York, having a successful life. I said, Dad, I can't take it anymore. I have to do something real. She came back six months ago. She founded a bamboo company and they're building Green Village. They have an initial 43 lots. I'm a father of a developer. <laughs> and this is the model, and this is the house. There. I, my heart is absolutely sore to see her shape rooms, move walls, develop new finishes and techniques. We're reinventing the bamboo world. There's the roof. And it's so, it's so exciting. People come. This is what the developer heard about that wanted me to come and meet him in the big building in Singapore. Green Village. It's called ibuku.com. Ibuku, in Indonesian, we call that your mother. We can also think about it being Mother Earth. So have a look at what my daughter, Laura, is up to. Local. How do you make a road without cement or petrochemicals? Why is it that uh, Botanical garden in Singapore is covered with cement and asphalt paths. I think about these things. If you put a fence around the botanical garden and put 20 people in there, they'd starve to death within a month. Why are we doing what we're doing in the world? We made our roads out of local volcanic rock. We made the sidewalks out of gravel. They flood when it rains. It's green. This guy, he's a member of the community. His name is Abu, and he's planning to eat that fence over there for dinner. All the fences are green, nitrogen fixing green. And it's, it's called life. And the whole place was a garden. And we kept the garden there. We dropped in the classrooms carefully into the garden. We kept the garden alive. I don't mean the Queen Elizabeth's beautiful memorial garden. I mean food. Food for people to eat. We dropped in these guys, which are Bali's last black pigs. Why is the black pig disappearing? And why is skin bleaching Cosmetic, the biggest seller in Bali. All women want to have whiter skin, and women own the pigs, and they all have whiter pigs. <laughs> it's, if you ask the grandmothers, the grandmothers go, those white pigs taste like nothing. The black pigs were tasty, delicious, they were smart. So we're happy with the kids, we're keeping the black pig alive. <clears throat> this is the cow. The cow has, this is a very smart cow. 
this cow is plotting how to put the lawnmower out of business on the playing field. <laughs> how many of you eat rice, have eaten rice? <laughs> Any potato eaters out there? Okay, how many, now I want to see hands this time. How many have you, of you have planted rice? Oh. <laughs> okay. These kids have planted rice, looked after rice, harvested rice, threshed rice, cooked rice, and shared it with their friends. This is something that may be a part of an education that we're missing. It may be something that's very valuable in the future to know. They will never look at a bowl of rice again the same way. And that's Bali rice. That's the real rice that's this tall. It's so beautiful. These are eggplants. We're teaching the kids. Can you imagine if this was lettuce instead of whatever it is? And we had somebody with scissors and they cut it fresh and they had some salad dressing out there for lunch. And we ate the decoration for the stage for lunch. <laughs> That's where we are. These kids have vegetables growing right beside where they study mathematics. And efficiencies. Kids come to school and go home. So right now, 15 families are getting a basket three times a week of organic vegetables that go home with the kids. We have an amazing guy who came from Seattle. He got killed, as a lot of people did in the property crisis. He sold what was left. He said, I'm out of here, I'm going to Bali. He's roasting coffee. It's going home with the kids. His wife is making raw food. They're really pioneers. But these vegetables go into kitchens. And what are you going to tell the grandchildren about the gas? Not that gas, the, the cooking gas. <laughs> what are you going to tell them? Oh, it took 10 million years to make. We burned it up in 120 years. Tough luck. Go cut down a tree. Oh, we also cut down all the trees. <coughs> this is a local woman cooking lunch for 350 on a sawdust fire. I can plant more bamboo. I can saw more bamboo up and make buildings. I can't make more gas. It's really amazing that the things that she brings in from her grandma, the things her grandma finds for us down by the river that are not available in the supermarket, it's a rediscovery of food. Green School has kids from 40 countries. Can you imagine graduating from a school and having friends in 40 countries? It's globalization, it's what's upon us. And they're learning how, we're, how they're going to manage what's going on in the world, which is a lot of countries that are going to be looking for a little bit of water and a little bit of food and a little bit of oil. They learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's the core of the school. Don't think this is a strange school where your kids will not know how to compete at Harvard. It's really serious. But beyond that, we take away the hypothetical. We give them real experience. These kids learn to build. They practice age-old arts with the Balinese. And the mothers weren't entirely happy about this. <laughs> the Balinese did, didn't have foam pads, so they did their, their martial arts in the rice fields, which are soft. The kids get really dirty. And Cynthia and I made a crazy commitment, which is really heavy upon my, my shoulders. If we're going to build a school, we have to have it local. Local materials, we also have to have local kids. Most Indonesians that can afford to send their kid to school are sending them to Perth, or Adelaide, or Singapore. So the Balinese kids at the school, 20% of the school is our target, our sponsor. And people have come forward, visitors to the school, have come forward from 
and support the Balinese scholarship program to keep these kids in. What we're, going, what we're making is Canadians can't tell, well, you know the English couldn't tell Malaysians what to do. Canadians certainly can't tell Balinese what to do. But if these kids get through this school and go on to further education and then come back to Bali, to Indonesia, they're on the ground solidly. They are future green leaders. The gifts to the school are amazing. This man has a Javanese wife. He came from Java and he did bio-intensive gardens and these gardens are run by ex-street kids trained on the learning farm in Bogor, which is near, near Jakarta. And these gardens will create six times more vegetables than a normal plot run by a normal Indonesian. Another woman came from Africa with the marimba. And it's amazing how many people are reaching out to Green School to see what they can do to help. The teachers are as diverse as the students that come from all over the world. There's one or two Indonesian teachers in each class so that the class is constantly breaking up into small groups. And it's, it's an amazing place to come and see. And the lunch that we talked about, you're all invited. Not all the same day, but when you're feeding 400, if 25 come, I have a pocket full of of uh, bamboo business cards. Write to me, tell me you're in Bali, you want to come to Green School for lunch and we'll make it happen. It's, it's amazing to taste food that grew. Right? If we eat these for lunch, we'll probably die. <laughs> <laughs> Disabled. Dis. There's even the kids have something called being dissed. I mean, I'm sure you've been dissed if you've got kids. Dyslexic. Richard Branson considers dyslexia a gift, but when he was in school, they didn't know what the hell to do to him. He wanted to send the thing up in space. He wanted to have an airline. He was learning different. So we renamed it. We've done a lot of funny things, but dyslexia, we changed to prolexia, because it is a gift. I'm dyslexic. I'm sure many of you are dyslexic. So the prolexics in the, in the green school, we honor. And not putting them in these concrete boxes with asbestos roofs focuses them. They love it. They're happy. A happy prolexic can learn just as well as a regular kid. And the regular kids are doing really well. Green school effect. We've got professors that are doing PhDs coming to study what is the effect of environment on learning. <laughs> and how is this made possible? Giant grass. And nobody is poor enough, ignorant enough, dirty enough, uneducated enough to live in a bamboo house. Everybody wants a concrete house. <laughs> But in Bali, it comes out of the ground like a train. It could grow as high as a coconut tree in two months. And after three years, when it's cut, it's strong enough to make a span like this. It's stronger than steel by weight. It's, after three years, it's as dense as teak. It is the most amazing thing that's right here in front of you. And an amazing woman in Bali named Linda Garland told me about bamboo, and I'm a wood guy. Bamboo, I'm sure, no. For years, she told me about bamboo. Finally, there was a treatment, which is called borax, which makes it a sustainable timber. The bugs come, they bite the bamboo. Doesn't kill them. They get diarrhea and go home. <laughs> so we had architects, and they brought us things like this. And that wonderful yellow box up there was the administration complex, and you can guess that I'm probably not too hot on administration. It's necessary, but I really didn't want to build the world's biggest bamboo building for administrators. So the most important thing we did is we renamed it. We renamed it Heart of School. It is the Heart of School. It's a 
two helixes running different directions and a double helix in the center. It's, it's all about the name. It's all about the intention. There's administrators out there. I know there are. And we built those models that I was telling you about. And giving Balinese artisans reams of plans, not to mention reams of legal documents. They just looked at us like we were insane. We gave them the model, they carved a bamboo ruler, they picked, they measured the model, they went to the bamboo pile, picked a piece of bamboo, and they built green school artisans using age-old techniques. Bamboo pins. There's also bolts. They did it mostly by hand. We've got a shortage of cranes at Green School. But even the Balinese want to be modern. Of course, everyone wants to be modern, have the latest. The Balinese builders that built Green School had the latest and greatest metal scaffolding because they didn't want to have bamboo scaffolding. So when the scaffolding came down, we had a cathedral an amazing cathedral, a cathedral of the green, but more than that, a cathedral of the green education. And it, it was magic, three months. It was laid out on the ground, we slept there, we drank there, some people drank too much there. <laughs> and we tramped this building. And you'll notice that little cement thing in the middle takes almost as long to build as that giant tower on the side. So if you're trying to figure out whether to build cement or bamboo, you know. But up it went. <coughs> bamboo is, is a dream. Please come and visit. We're building every day. If you're a builder, come and help us build. There goes the thatch. Along along it's called. It's, uh, it's a grass that grows everywhere that isn't fit for rice or vegetables. So it's the ultimate use of use of materials. About two hundred men. of bamboo, it may not be the world's largest structure because we're not really into measuring who's bigger, although most men are. <laughs> and they tell me in Singapore, if you don't have a big Mercedes, a, a proper flat and a giant diamond ring, you don't even get married. <laughs> but. A lot of people think it's the most beautiful bamboo building in the world. So can you do this? And this is a hard thing to say in a place like London, because they really can't. But you guys can. You're Malaysia. You're the future. And these are the rules. Be local. Use local materials. Let the environment lead. Think about the breeze. Think about the sun and the moon. Think about the land. And think about how your grandchildren are going to have to build. Because you know perfectly well that cement is not endless. Oil is not endless. Steel is not endless. So what are we leaving for them to build with? In Las Vegas, they Demolition engineers work with the engineers to create cavities at the base of the buildings that are then sealed so that they can blow them up in 20 years. What are we doing? So, this is at greenschool.org. Mr. Gore, you ruined my bloody life. I'm supposed to be playing golf, but I'm here. 
And if you want to get involved, if you think there's something here, I mean, India is crying out, but Malaysia is a fertile field to do something for our kids, to do something for our grandchildren. Thank you very much. questions to the floor. If any of you want to ask uh, John a question, please put up your hand. Just say your name and where you're from so that he has an idea. Thank you. Um, it's me again. Um, Thomas, do, do you think that Bali Green School is the best school in Indonesia? The best school in the world? Does it serve its function as well as any school in Europe or US or anywhere else that claims to be a good school? Uh, do you deliver students who are of equal or better quality? And finally, tying back to the question I asked a bit earlier, was your school cheaper to build? Thank you. Well, Oprah recently built a school in, uh, in Africa, and she won't tell me what she paid for it. But it's a big concrete school in the middle of Africa, and to make it African, they put three colors on the front of it, the facade. So, green school, bamboo you know is cheap, and you can, where's my gun? You, you ran away. Oh, there you go. Bamboo is cheap. You know that, and concrete is getting more expensive. In terms of the kids, we only, I only have anecdotal evidence. There's only one green school so far, so it's perfect for the kids that are there. I sure as hell don't want all your kids, excuse me. I, I don't want all your kids because there's no way we can handle them. But people that are motivated, my sister wrote to me, and my sister's a little prickly sometimes, I don't call her often enough. And she said, is this true? And I went, gosh, what did I do now? <laughs> Some guy from Calgary had written that he sold this house and he was moving to Bali to go to the green school with his kids. And she was going, is this true? I haven't actually checked, but it's probably true. So the people that are highly motivated, that had a tough time in school, that see the dream, are coming. Now, there's been kids that have left for Germany, and because of things they did at green school, little videos and green projects, They've been given scholarships in Berlin at a very good school. Now, everybody wants to graduate from Harvard or Stanford. But I think that by the time our kids graduate, which is two more, two and a half more years, just coming from the Green School will probably get you an interview at any college in the world, at least an interview. And that's really good for guys like me. I couldn't, I wanted to be a fireman. I couldn't pass the fireman test. So, yeah, I think there's huge opportunities for the people that want to be at Green School. I'm not saying it's better, I'm just saying it's different, and it's perfect for the people that are there. Questions? I have a question for you, John. Me. Um, I'm just wondering, how long did your dream take to come to fruition? You know, the, you know, we saw the pictures and we saw, you know, the process in like jump cuts. But in reality, you know, how did you know from the, when the idea came to mind? The start from of the moment of the meeting beside the river, with the educators talking about holistic education, and talking about dreams and possibilities for a school-centric community to open the school was 18 months. 18 months? Yeah, we were still building, we will still be building. We're building a bridge, I, I found out recently. But we're building all the time, we're building a new pre-K. And we got the pre-K kids, with little tiny kids. But when I was that big, I was on the roof with my dad, handing him nails while he was nails, 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 while he was nails. 
nails, while he was 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 nails,